Hey, I was on a plane uh, heading back from a mission trip. I was in South America, and there was a businessman behind me, a Dallas guy on his phone. I couldn't help but hear him. He's right behind me. And he was going on about his great business deals and all that he was all about, and he was such a powerful, wonderful businessman. He was down there doing his work, and he was talking about a colleague of his that was there in this nation uh, in South America, and he was telling of, of a guy here in Dallas, he was talking to his supervisor, somebody, some partner here in Dallas, and he said, he said, yeah, man, we had a great time, you know, this deal and that, and he said, uh, man, this guy, his, his partner here, he said, this guy is the, is the nicest, he was the kindest, laziest guy I've ever worked with in my life, and I couldn't help, there and he went on and on, I couldn't help but, but think, uh, ask the question, okay, was this guy lazy or did he just know how to rest? Those are very different things, you know. And there are other cultures, South America, Central America, other places, there, there are other cultures who actually have siestas. You know this, right? I mean, who's smart? Who, who's up on somebody else? And I wondered then, what would rest look like? What does biblical rest look like in North Dallas? To some, it might look like laziness. You know, when you look at the life of Jesus, he was often busy, but he was never in a hurry. And what we don't do so well here in Dallas is rest. Laziness is not our problem. But the thing that I encounter more than anything else in our church family, praying over young men in particular and couples at times, but I run into more and more young men in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s who are struggling constantly with anxiety, worry, unrest, dis ease of the soul. I think that all of us can listen and learn how to practice one of the oldest commands in all of Scripture. It's Sabbath rest, but I want to be clear from the start. I'm not just talking about a day of the week. I'm not talking about a really good nap on a Sunday afternoon. That's a good thing. I'm talking about deep, soulful, gospel rest of the Spirit, regardless of what, ha what is happening in your life. And so, as Betty led us so well and read earlier, I want you to turn to Psalm 46, and we're going to unpack this psalm, and then I'm going to run to other places in Scripture, but you'll see most of those um, references on the screen. You don't have to turn there necessarily. You could stay open there at Psalm 46. I want you to you take notes on, on sermons, it's a good thing to do. You have a spot there on the back of your bulletin if you'd like. Bring a journal, bring your Bible, always. Psalm 46. Our, our key word today that we're focusing on is rest. And you've already sensed it, how well uh, our, 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 our um, service has been crafted to guide us to think already to ponder the rest that we find in Christ, ultimately. But here's the questions I want to ask. Four questions we're going to look at as we walk through this, this message together and then apply it to our lives always. Why do we need it? Why do we struggle with it? Where do we find it? And then how do we live in it? Those four questions will guide us through our time together. So first, let's look at this passage again. I want to unpack it a little bit. Uh, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge. That is to say, He's our safe shelter He's a safe place to hide, is what the psalmist is saying. He's a, a refuge and strength. He's a very present help in trouble. He's ready to help, is what he's saying. Therefore, because this is true, we will not fear. Now listen to the graphic hyperbolic language that he uses. The psalmist, as if he could think of the most um, tumultuous activity that he could possibly think of. To set this in contrast up against God, who is our refuge. We will not fear, though the earth gives way, even in an earthquake or some cataclysmic event, though the mountains be moved into the sea, the heart of the sea. 
though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. You're going to notice here that given to the choir master, Selah, Selah. You'll see it three times. This is a pause. We think this is where the music stops. Just stop. Just, just take that in. Rest. Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So God's presence is flowing like a river. It's peaceful in Zion, the holy habitation of the Most High. So this is Jerusalem, but ultimately this would be the peace of God, the place of God, the people of God where He resides. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God is will help her when morning dawns. This is to say, when she wakes up, he's there. Nothing to fear as you face the day. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. They fall. The, uh, he utters his voice. The earth melts. He's so powerful. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The God wrestler, the army of a host or the Lord of, of the army of, of angels is with us. Selah. Verse 8. I want you to see there's two imperatives here we're going to focus on. The first one is right here. Come, behold, look, intently stare at, gaze, look. Look at the works of the Lord. How He has brought desolations that is destruction on the earth. He he, he, he makes wars cease. He brings peace to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Here's the next imperative. The first one was what? Behold. The second, be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And he's saying, I, I will win. I will be raised up. Everyone will see. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. So the essence of this psalm is this. Be still and behold. I could say it this way. Stop and stare at him and you'll find rest. The central point of this message, you will find rest for your soul when you stop and stare at Jesus. Be still and behold Him. Friends, as I was preparing this message, and many of you know, uh, I've walked through some, some healing still taking place after an accident. Uh, I have I've had to stop. I've been still before the Lord over many weeks until recent days up and about and doing, doing well, by the way, but you cannot imagine how I want so desperately for you to learn what God is teaching me and teaching me anew in these days. I don't have a great need to be creative or a great need to be smart or anything today, but you can't imagine the passion that I feel for you to get this, for our church family, for you to live in gospel rest, soulful peace, regardless of what's going on in your life. So I want you to think about how the earth is giving way in your life, how the mountains are, are tumbling into the sea. What are you wrestling with? What are you walking through? I want you to name it. I want you to focus on it. What brings anxiety and worry into your life? As I've said often, the Scriptures teach us, your anxiety points you to your idols, points you to your God. And for you, maybe it's, maybe it's a vocational challenge. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's relational. Maybe like many that I talk to, you wrestle with, a, with an unease, an uneasy spirit. You can't rest. And when you rest, your mind is never at rest. I think all of us struggle with this in varying degrees. And so today we're going to learn what it is, even as believers, to say, let's, let's be reminded that our faith is not about working harder and getting better. Our work has been done. It's about believing more deeply what's already been accomplished for us in Christ. 
So let's ask the questions. Why do we need rest? Well, I don't know that we need to answer this question, but think about it. Life is hard. This is what the psalmist is saying. Do you feel like the earth is giving way? Again, I want you to name it and, and focus on that because the Lord's going to help you today overcome what you're facing. You know, in fact, we can't function without rest. You know that you live, uh, you know, let's say you live 80 years or beyond. If you live just 80 years, you're going to sleep over 26 years of your life. Now, that's a nap, right? That is a long time. That's a lot of life. God could have created us any way he wanted to, but he, he created us so that we need rest. That's kind of a bizarre thing when you think about it. That we have to lay down. He's even given us night and day. He gives us darkness so that you, as if to say, I'm not even going to let you be able to see real well. You might as well just lay down. And then go to sleep. You're going to rest better if the light is gone. He's created us this way. But here's what's interesting. Just as there are physical laws that govern the physical universe, you see, there are then uh, spiritual laws that govern our relationship with Him. Even the way He's created the world, He's created us to need rest. But ultimately, He's pointing us to the fact that we all need rest in Him. It was Augustine who said, Thou hast made us for Thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until we find rest in Thee. Friends, this is where it begins. Why do we need rest? Because we've been created to rest in God. Why do we struggle with rest? Why do we struggle with soulful, deep, constant ease of mind and soul? Notice he says, be still. And that's really the operative uh, you know, verse there, verse 10. Be still. This is an imperative. I said, behold and be still. This is cease striving. Literally, in the Hebrew, it's let your hands hang down. Stop. Stop it. Quit working. Quit trying to fix it yourself. Instead, just first stop. That's what he says. Stop. Be still. And then behold. Know that I am God. I think it's harder for us to rest here in North Dallas and in our culture than perhaps anywhere on the planet and perhaps any time in all of history. I think it's hard for us to rest for many reasons. One is workaholism. We work more than any people in any culture in all of history. I remember years ago reading a study that was put out in the 60s and they were saying with all the technological advances and such that people in the 90s and beyond in the new millennium are going to be working about 20 hours a week. How's that working out for you? Technology has not helped us. See, now, how about this? Now, we can work anywhere because we can carry around a computer with us, email constantly uh, in touch with others. You can now work anywhere, so we work everywhere. And there's no rest. You can imagine, for me, uh, I, there's times I have to, you know, as a pastor, the needs are always there. There's always more to be done. Maybe your life is that way. There are times I have to say, I have to, I have to put this down. I've got to get away from that. And as I've noted recently, please, while you're driving, get away from it. We can't get away from it. We're, we're always on the move, and when we stop, even our minds are moving. Workaholism, technology is not helping us. And, and, and I think, too, job security today, or I could say job insecurity, is a great challenge and problem. Maybe, again, more than any other time in our nation's history. If your department, if you're not performing, oh, we can just get rid of you. There's no real, there's, there's no real you know, covenant. We just want to make money. And so we feel it. And we feel it at every level in the organization. I think, too, in the past, you know, traditionally, we used to define ourselves. Our identity, our worth was found through our family, our tribe. That's who I am. But today, so often, this is true for, for women. It's true for men as well. I'd say more for men. Often, we find our identity in our work. And... and 
And so we wrestle with that. It's the second question after somebody asks you, what's your name? Oh, what do you do? And then we seek to define ourselves by what we do. And we must perform well. But here's a greater problem. The greater problem is that there is work underneath the work. There's work that must be done that's under the work, and we all know it. Here's what I mean. There's work that's unfinished within us. We all sense it, and we all know it. There's this need to complete ourselves. We seek the approval of others. We we, we identify ourselves or find worth or value in our performance again, or maybe by the way we look maybe even by our families, often very good things. We seek to define ourselves. There's work underneath the work, and we know that the work is not finished. We're not complete, and we know it. And we keep on striving. We keep on working. And many of us, many of our friends, particularly those who don't know the Lord, and I could say many of us, we we struggle with it. We don't realize that more will never be enough. And yet we live that way. They asked J.D. Rockefeller, of course, the the wealthiest man on the planet in the early 1900s. Even by modern standards, people say he was the first billionaire. uh, And and even now, he's still the wealthiest man who ever lived, short of Solomon, probably in the Bible. They asked him how much money is enough. And he responded, just a little bit more. And he died an insane man, eaten up by the need for more, more money, the next great pleasure, the next experience, the next thrill. And many of us, in varying degrees, are living that way. Need more, got to have more, more, more. And more will never be enough. We cannot rest. And so even when we seek to rest, deep down we know there's more work to be done. I'm not finished. I'm not done trying to define myself. So we rarely live at ease, at peace. So where do we find it? Well, the psalmist says, clearly, we find the rest that we need from God. We rest in Him. But what does that mean? Well, to understand this, we've got to understand rest from a biblical perspective. In the Bible, we first find rest in a very unusual place and with a very unexpected person. You know where? Where do we first see rest in the Bible? Where? The book of Genesis. It's Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Is God resting because he's tired? It sure seems that way. God's not tired. He spoke creation into being. He didn't need to raise a finger to create all things. So he's resting for another reason. He's resting then to institute the Sabbath for his people, a pattern that they would follow very specifically so they would know exactly how to enter into a pattern of rest. So whatever the Sabbath is, and we're going to see this, it's a perfect thing. God finished His work. He looked at it and He said, it's finished and it's good. It's complete. Now Sabbath. So whatever the Sabbath is, and we're going to unpack this a bit along the way, it, it's not something that you grow into. It's not something you, 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 you work towards. It's something you step into. It's something you discover. It's realizing that it's something that's perfect. It's finished. It's complete. So the meaning of Sabbath is, is rest. It's not just a day of the week. It's not a Saturday for for, uh, for the Jew, it's not, it's not even Sunday. Sabbath, the true Sabbath, goes beyond that. The word Shabbat is the same word, the root word where we get rest, we get seven, and the word Sabbath. But in the end, it means rest. But there's a true Sabbath that goes beyond the day of the week. The true Sabbath rest, listen, the sh- how about this? The, the rest that we see in the Old Testament is but a shadow 
In theological terms, it's a type. It's a foreshadowing. It's a picture. All of the New Testament, you know this, do you not? Shadows in the New Testament point to Christ, who ultimately fulfills them and thus ends them. So Sabbath rest points to Christ, who would ultimately say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. We'll see what that means in a moment. You know that every lamb that was sacrificed at the altar was a shadow of Christ, the perfect lamb to come. You know that the tabernacle was a shadow of Christ who would come. The place where God would reside is in the person of Jesus Christ. The high priest in all of his garments and his office was a shadow pointing to Christ, the ultimate high priest who would stand between us and God and intercede, offer sacrifice on our behalf. You read the book of Hebrews, you see how beautifully this all is brought forth by its writer. So, as we look at the Old Testament shadows, we're looking forward to the coming of the one who would fulfill these and end them in the end. And so, Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He says, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. What he's saying when he says he's the Lord, is he, I am the Sabbath. So there's a rest that goes beyond a nap. There's a rest beyond a day of the week. There's a Sabbath rest for every one of us, even in tumultuous times. And so it would say in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Paul says, therefore, let us not... No one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. What's he talking about? He's talking about Jewish laws and festivals. And and it says here, or, or, or with regard to festival of a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Christ lived the perfect life, fulfilling all of the crushing demands of God's law. All of the laws. He finished the work that needed to be done so that the writer of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It is available to us now. For whoever enters God's rest also ceases from his labors as God did from his. You see, the implications here are that we cease from our work, from our effort, from our endless striving, and we rest in the work of another. Friends, listen, this is the secret to the Christian life. At the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is rest of the soul. Is that true of your life? And friends, to the degree that it is not is the degree to which you are experiencing unrest in your life fighting against him, kicking against his work. A yoke is a symbol of servitude. It's the end of self-service. To be yoked means the ending. It's the end of your running, running your own life. And that's what Jesus is saying. Come alongside me and learn from me. Walk with me and you'll find rest. My yoke is easy. Well, each week we've been looking at these psalms and we've asked the question, what does this look like in real life? And so today, we're going to hear from Dr. Debbie Newman Riesling, who's on our staff, a minister of pastoral care and, and counseling, and she models for all of us who get to work with her daily what it is to live out of this gospel rest, even in the midst of tumultuous times. So, listen to Debbie's story. I think what I want people to know is that God has asked me to walk through some very, very painful realities in the last few years. My husband of 27 and a half years died suddenly and all of a sudden my world was turned upside down and um, just less than two years later, my son who was trying to make his way back to God, sort of back and forth, um, was involved in a DWI accident that turned into a murder charge and 
two years after that, he was um, convicted of murder and sentenced to 75 years in prison, which I never expected in a million years. I believe God prepared me to be ready to face these tragedies through learning how to rest in Him and to, to recognize I didn't have control anyway. Um, but we're, we're studying Psalm 46 today, and my favorite part of that psalm is to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted among the earth. And for me, those three parts are all of what prepare me to go through the hard realities that I face to, I learned first to be still. And in that being still, I, I learned that God is there for me. And so I was able to turn to Him in my tragedies and believe that He would never leave me or forsake me and that I could get through this through with His power and His presence in my life. And that's one of the reasons I like to offer silent retreats to the church members as the minister of congregational care. Learning to know God in silence has been so beneficial to my spiritual walk and my walk with God that I want other people to have those opportunities. And being still is um, taking a step back and, and saying, God, you would not ask me to go through this tragedy or this hard thing if it had no benefit. I mean, there may be some really harsh realities that I have to face about it and deal with it, but there, are, there is always a spiritual benefit to everything that we go through. And I would never believe that I I'd be able to, to feel peace in these circumstances, but I really do. I have a peace that passes understanding, and that comes from being still and knowing God. I hope that if people know the hard things that I've faced in life and the, the realities that I'm dealing with and they wonder what it how do you do that how do you how, how do you be happy how do you enjoy life how do you still trust God um, my answer would be it comes through learning and really accepting this invitation to rest in him and, and not strive against him not strive about things I can't control. I can't make things differently and walk with him through stillness. Friends, you can trust him. You can trust him. Whatever you're going through, whatever you thought about, whatever changes or tumultuous times you're walking through, whatever your challenges, you can trust him. You're going to have to decide. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to rid yourselves of those places you go, how you seek to determine your own value and worth. There's a decision to be made. It's why we must strive to enter the rest. The striving is not our work. The striving is a decision. That we're going to trust God. It's why in Hebrews 4, verse 3, it says this, for we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. What is he saying? He's referencing those, again, who are coming out of the Exodus, and they're going to either enter into the promised land, the place of rest, or they're going to choose not to trust him. And God says they will never find rest apart from me. And in his wrath... There is a price to be paid. His wrath is simply a holy reaction to those who will not trust Him. He's saying rest in Him. It's a choice. You can choose to run your own life, work hard, or get better, or you can rest in the finished work of Christ. You can live forgiven. 
or you can seek to stay on this never-ending path that will lead to death. In fact, Isaiah 57 says this, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. In Christ, God says it is good. This is my Son, my beloved Son, who lives the perfect life on our behalf. It's why Christ could say on the cross, it is finished. The work for us has been completed. Now all that's left for us to do is give Him our lives. Why do we need rest? Because God's created us to find rest in Him. Why do we struggle with it? We refuse to trust Him. Where do we find it? In Christ alone. How do we live in it? You will find rest for your soul when you stop and stare at Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word, how good it is to hear of the promises that you've brought to us, that there's a Sabbath rest. I pray for every person here who, those who have not yet received your grace, they are working so hard. There's no rest for the weary. There's no rest apart from you. Friend, if you're here with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never received Christ, His grace, His finished work for you, His punishment upon the cross, receive it now by faith. Not by works, nothing you can do. Just say yes to Him now. Say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I give you my life. And for those of you, for us who have received His grace, we know we've been eternally blessed and given security for all eternity. You're forgiven. But today is a day that can mark the rest of your life. Give Him your life. Let your hands hang down. Cease striving. Know that he's God. What are you going to do? How will you live differently? Give it to him. Lord, help us to be still and to know that you are God. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.